welcome to Light Channel Denmark, David, and thank you very much for taking time to pass by our little tiny country here on the map. And we're gra very grateful that uh, you took the time, even if it's summer holiday mm -hmm. for many people now. But um, I would like to cover some of the questions that I know it's in the air. A lot of people are asking questions about you as a person, about you as a ministry. Uh, so just to start at the right spot, could you tell us a little bit about yourself as a person? Just uh, spend a few minutes. Uh, where you born and what actually got you into the ministry where you are today? Go after the midday. Very happy to be here, Michael. And uh, uh, it's about, I think it's my third trip, but I, I hadn't seen the studio yet, so I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I was born in the U.S., but my parents moved to South America, to Bolivia, so, uh, about a year after I was born. Mm. And I, was, I grew up in Bolivia, South America. My parents worked in the jungles. Uh, my dad is a pastor pilot, and he became a nurse years later as well. My mother is a, a professional nurse. And so I grew up in the medical work and the church work, raising churches. My father had a large area to cover. As a pilot, he covered 300 uh, miles radius mm. and was responsible for all the churches in the Seventh-day Adventist church there. So I grew up completely immersed in in mission work and, and medical work. Uh, of course, you go through the teenage years. We returned back to the U.S. as I was entering my teenage years. And I finished high school, uh, started studying um, the university um, there. And I had to choose what I was going to do. But around those years, um, I had a chance to meet, again, one of my best friends as a childhood. Uh, as, as I grew up, another missionary family had come to work in Bolivia. Uh, in the, the, as the treasurer of the Bolivia Mission, which is now the Bolivia Union, and, and director of education. And they also had four children, and I was the oldest, and I, I became the best friend of their oldest daughter. We grew up together, uh, best of friends. When I was eight years old, I decided I wanted to marry her, so mm -hmm. I asked her to marry me. Uh, she agreed. Yeah. But, but then we didn't see each other for nearly 10 years, and we met again in the, at the university mm -hmm. years later. And uh, we fell in love again, and we did get married. And B Becky, and Becky, as we call her, I'm Uncle David, and Aunt Becky, uh, we've been working together. We're both pilots. We're both nurses. And uh, I followed in the footsteps of my father, being a pastor, pilot, nurse. And uh, I dedicated my life 30 years working for the church mm. in different responsibilities, uh, 11 years with ADRA, um, hospital administration, mission aviation, communication department, uh, putting up TV stations for the for the church. Mm. So I've dedicated my life, and I still, after 30 years, even though I'm not on salary anymore, I'm still working for the growth of the church and, mm. and installing television networks, radio networks, aviation, schools, uh, and areas, isolated areas of the world. Uh, nothing has changed. Mm. My first love is still preparing people for Jesus' second coming and mm. to maintain the mission of the church. Uh, to a great extent, Many people have forgotten the original mission, mm. and, uh, but that's what I dedicated my life to, and I haven't changed, and that is preparing a generation for Jesus' second coming, and I believe it is very imminent. Mm. I believe the great crisis, the great storm is right before us, and my wife and I have dedicated our, our lives to, to going around the world and, and starting up projects um, and encouraging people to dedicate their life to volunteer mission service for the Lord. That's, uh, that's wonderful. So your dedication and you followed, mm. as you mentioned, you followed up in the footsteps of your parents and your dedication hasn't actually uh, decreased over the years. None is, at all. Is that so? It's increased. Mm. Um, I, have, I have found my life work. Even though I loved working for the church on salary, most of the 30 years I was paid by, by the denomination, um, I realized toward the end of those 30 years that there were areas that the church did not have money to mm. pay a salary. Uh, for example, there were area emission aviation. We have mm. very, very few airplanes in the church. 30 years ago, we had mm. more, but they've been closed down because of finances and risk and liability. And, and so today, uh, there's no less need, more need mm. exists. So uh, today, we started placing missionary airplanes in different places, looking for volunteer pilots to operate, and so that 
that, so that the church could carry out to its work in isolated areas as well and help the people directly with health work. Yeah. And, and so we've done that, and, and we're working now in 94 countries of the world, wow. uh, have over 40 airplanes. Mm. Uh, none of them are luxury airplanes. They're mm. all mission bush planes. Mm. Some of them are more equipped for, for long-range flight. Others are equipped for bush flying into short fields. Uh, whatever the you know, seaplanes, whatever is necessary. Mm. Uh, but the media is to reach the people that we can't reach physically and uh, to go into their homes with the truth. And uh, the airplanes are to physically provide transportation to those that are in need. Wonderful. And he just mentioned that actually mm -hmm. the end goal, it's actually to prepare the people for the imminent coming of Jesus Christ. Yes. And that ca can be done in, in different ways. And one of the ways you have decided to do it together with your wife and uh, the, the people that are actually are supporting your ministry is through aviation. That, that's one of the... Uh yes, uh, aviation, schools, mm -hmm. secondary, primary schools in areas where they don't have education for the children. Yeah. Uh, medical work, uh, television and radio. We have orphanages as well. Yeah. Okay, so why did you decide to go for the aviation mm -hmm. ministry? Well, my father was a pilot, so mm -hmm. I grew up flying uh, with my father. And, of course, um, I, my wife is a pilot. Mm. I have two, two, uh, two children. Uh, well, actually, uh, three that studied, but only two finished. And uh, a son-in-law who's a pilot as well. Even though th none of them are working in aviation full-time, I, I became a professional, and, and I've been flying now for 40 mm. years, uh, approximately. Um, we use aviation to get into areas that mm -hmm. you can't reach, and we use aviation to move between countries. From c I just came back from Suriname a few days ago. I came to Germany, and we, uh, the mission president. Uh, it's, in, it's interesting, uh, Michael, to note that, uh, that in some parts of the world, uh, we still preserve the, the mission of the church as I grew up and I knew it when I was a child. Mm. Other areas have changed so much, I don't even recognize mm -hmm. the church, and it's not really... To me, it's not really the Seventh-day Adventist Church because the Seventh-day Adventist Church, the name yes. tells us yeah. what the focus is. And uh, to, to preach uh, the second coming of Jesus, the Advent, the second coming, imminent Advent. Uh, some people do not believe any imminent return of Jesus. Mm -hmm. I certainly do, and that's what we teach and preach. Yeah. But there are parts of the world that do believe that. Uh, in the Caribbean Union, um, uh, the administration there, some of the... Bo some of the administration of the union are on my board. We work together. We have always worked together closely. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the Suriname mission, where they speak Dutch, <coughs> it used to be the Dutch Guyana mm -hmm. uh, years ago. Uh, the president called me and said, we've been watching what you've been doing in Guyana. We want to do it here too. So I flew over there last year. And, and just this week, we in, uh, at this very moment, we're, uh, we have finished our purchase. I signed the documents. Uh, the, the, pay the monies have been paid completely. And we're going on the air with four television networks digital. Uh, in Suriname. Praise the and Lord. And radio. Yes, and so it's, it's, it's wonderful to work together. Yeah. But you have to be on the same wavelength. Mm, exactly. There's some church yeah. administrators. Mm. I would say that I don't recognize which church they belong mm. to anymore. They don't believe anything that I believe. Yeah. While, while others are, are right on target mm. and still believe our mission, original mission. And so with them, it's easy to work. Yes. With those that no longer believe the message, uh, I don't know how to work. It just depends on, on what you believe. How can two, Jesus said, how can two walk together unless they be agreed? Exactly, and we had this conversation mm -hmm. earlier this morning, and we were uh, discussing about not having the same platform. Uh, it doesn't make it possible. It's almost impossible to work with somebody that within the Seventh-day Adventist Church that doesn't believe any longer in the spirit of prophecy and all the guidance. It's uh, th the authority has... Uh, switched from the spirit of prophecy today to a man-made theology. And, and that's, that's a very clear um, understanding today. But let me just go back a little bit to your, uh, to your personal ministry. Uh, beside aviation, you mentioned uh, schools. Uh, wha why schools and how do you decide to, to choose in which part of the world you, you want to do that? Well, uh, schools are very important to give opportunities to our young people or any young person to be able to be educated uh, properly, a balanced education, which includes work and academic mm. and practical uh, training. Uh, it includes spiritual training yeah. so that the young person can capture the vision of what we are called to do in this world. I mean, God has a plan for every single person. 
but some people grew up never knowing exactly, God's plan yeah. or not really being encouraged to yeah. follow that plan. So we encourage the young people when they finish to pick a profession or a training or a specialty that will allow them to serve mm. uh, in God's work. It can be health work. It can be technical skills. I mean, one of the hardest skills that we can find today is uh, uh, IT, mm. uh, you know, uh, 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 information technology. Um, it's easier to find a doctor than it is to find well, an engineer. Mm. And, 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 you know, an information technology, IT and web page, web page management. And so uh, we, we train the young people, whatever the skills God has given you, mm. dedicate them to God's service mm -hmm. because we have a job to do and it's a short time in which to do it. So, so there is a vision that's not lacking. There is a mission within that vision Absolutely. because we already have the package. And uh, as, as I know, you, you're following very much the spirit of prophecy guidance. Absolutely. We try our best. I know that we c we, we're not perfect. Uh, sometimes our variables in some countries, like in Bolivia, the country, the government is semi-communist mm -hmm. uh, in the way they look at things. Uh, they're, they're drifting more and more that way and it's making it harder and harder for private education. So we have to juggle a lot of things. We have to many times include certain areas that we would not normally include, but we try to balance everything and God has protected us so far. The, the local district supervisors, educational supervisors of the government think very, very highly of us and they protect us too because they can see that we're producing fine young people that are professionals and know what they're doing and, and can pass the exams which high, with higher grades and mm. scores in the local public schools. The education, it's a very important factor mm. within the mission of the church. Within it's part of our mission. Yeah. And if you don't prioritize education, mm. I know that uh, here recently, uh, some years back, we closed a school here in Denmark that was over 120 years old. Mm -hmm. This is very sad mm. because it goes to show that we, ha we are failing uh, in properly financing one of our main missions that we have, and that is properly educating our young people. Mm. Yes. Another part of your mission, you mentioned aviation, uh, you mentioned schools. Uh, then uh, it's the ministry, the media ministry or a television ministry. Uh, why do you think is that is so important based on, on your experience and knowledge of the Bible and, and the spirit of prophecy? Well, it, it boils down to a proper understanding of the mission. Mm -hmm. The question is, why do I exist here as a person? And why do I belong to the Seventh-day Adventist Church? What is the mission of the church? Mm. The mission of the church happens to be uh, very clear. So, so just to, uh, to jump in with a side question is uh, the identity of what you mm. believe that actually <laughs> defines the mission. Exactly. Okay. So it, it, if you lose, if you don't know where you came from, you do not know where you're going. Mm. So we have to know what our mission is to know where we came from and where we're going. The mission is to prepare a generation for Jesus' second coming. Jesus' second coming is imminent. It, it is at the doors. Uh, he has delayed because of us. But sometimes we blame God for the delay when in reality we're the ones to blame. So we love the world and the things of the world and therefore God in his love postpones his coming so that we will not be lost. But that, that door is almost closed. Mm. Very soon the door of opportunity will close and then we will start knocking on his door saying, mm. let me in, let me in. And he will say, I don't know who you are. Mm. The door will remain open for those that never heard. But those of mm. us who grew up knowing and have not reject, have rejected or gone to sleep and not acted upon it, mm. that we will not be able to go into that door. Yeah. I, I know that for many people that will sound like a bold claim that you're making that Jesus is coming soon. Can you back it up? And I'm not asking you to do it now uh, because I know you're most likely going to cover it tomorrow in the sermons that yes. or tonight uh, that we're going to have during the next meeting. Well, in summary, in summary, it boils down to Scripture again. Yeah. Jesus said in Matthew 24, when you see all these things, you can know that it's mm. even at the door. We're seeing all those things. Yeah. So we have to study the Scriptures to find out what things we, to be, we are to be looking for. Mm. In fact, you don't even have to be a Christian mm. to know that a great crisis is upon mm. us. If, we, if we're living like normal times, we are completely blind. Mm. Even the atheists who do not believe in God or anything they know a crisis is upon us. And so and to, to actually have scripture and to live a normal life thinking it's a long ways away mm. means we are totally blind. So what role do the TV and media play in, 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 in uh, this? Uh, there's a, there's in the world today, there is an attempt by the enemy of souls uh, to control the information people receive mm. so that 
they make decisions based on only the information they have. And if they only have bad information, they make bad decisions. And so the role of media today, as well as the role of presentations in schools and everything, is to expose people to truth. Mm -hmm. uh, people are looking for truth. Many people want and pray for truth, but it's not easily accessible. Mm. The role of media is to pl make it accessible so that anybody in the world, in this case, Light Channel Denmark, is to receive it in Danish, uh, just like other light channels in German and the Hungarian and Romanian and the, the European channels, Spanish, English, French, uh, German, uh, whatever, and Danish. Uh, they can, Dutch, they can receive it in their own language and then they can evaluate. Nobody can make a decision unless you have the variables on the table. And our job here, the job of media, is to place it, the information on the table and let honest people who are searching for, for mm. information to find it and make a decision directed by the Holy Spirit, of course, to accept God's plan of mm. salvation, which allows them to survive the crisis. Yeah. So you could coin the term truth exposers. That's actually... <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the I've never used it, but that's <laughs> correct. Yeah. Exposing truth, exposing mm. people to the truth mm. through the use of media and uh, printed material and uh, yeah. the internet. Uh, I believe the internet is was ordained of God mm. to allow to break down the controls of information. Today, you turn on a normal TV channel and you might hear a very, a very uh, lopsided view of the news, mm. depending on the political position of that station. Yeah, that's, um, that's a nice way to put it. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm doing I'm <laughs> saying it as nice as I can. <laughs> um, and then and then you have uh, you have uh, newspapers. Mm. They may also have a, a specific political direction. Uh, when I say political, I mean a human uh, <coughs> purpose to what they expose. But but on the Internet, you can find almost anything. So. Uh, God has protected it. The, the, the New World Order and uh, some of the leaders of the New World Order, uh, Hillary Clinton, when she was uh, uh, in, in, in office mm. as Secretary of State and others, she made it very clear that she did not like the Internet. Well, why? The Internet is filled with every type of trash you can find. Mm. Why did she not like? Because it gives access to truth as well. Mm. It's not that you can find trash anywhere. Yeah. But if, you were looking, if you're searching for truth, the Internet also has what you're looking for. Mm. And we pray that Light Channel... Denmark is a medium of communication that allows people to find truth. So do we, and, and that was actually mm. my next question, because a lot of people that probably uh, will uh, watch this interview, and in general, will say, well, that's your truth. Okay, we are here in the Western society in Europe and probably worldwide, we are moving toward the relativistic understanding of truth, and the pluralistic, and the majority voting. The majority decides what is truth or not. So whatever you say is true, that's okay for well, you. That's just in interesting. I would challenge any scientist, any physicist, any mm. chemist to give me relative truth. I can mix any two chemicals together and I can get whatever I want. Mm. Really? I can jump out of an airplane without a parachute and I will survive. Really? Mm. Oh, science doesn't support that. Mm. This relativism is totally false. Mm. Uh, if you believe that, you're going to be lost. You won't ha the, the only way you can... Uh, have a glass of water is to know is to know that water is clean it's safe to drink mm. you can you can do uh, construction you can do chemistry you can do physics only if you have a very clear understanding of science mm. and the laws of science are not relativistic yeah the laws of science are very clear it, a plus b equals c always and and if you if you change it you get something different mm. so so relativism anything goes is never observed mm. in the world only clear laws of, con of, of consequence and result are observed. The same thing happens on the human side. Yeah. God, God has very clearly stated in his word what the laws are. And that's, uh, to put it in a word, in a very intelligent person, I've been watching him, uh, to claim that uh, the truth is relative, it's a nonsensical statement. It's not observed in nature. Because that, that in itself requires actually an absolute truth to say that all oh. truth is relative. It's Th also another absolute truth. Yeah, it has to be absolute. So there is only one absolute, obviously, uh, according to a person that believes. But nevertheless, this is the society we live in. And, and mm -hmm. my personal understanding and experience is that a lot of people, they go this way without even thinking that this is wrong. Well, why do I believe this? And so... Uh, society has... Society, the enemy of souls uh, has... Uh, the influences in society have tried to program our minds to believe that there isn't anything as absolute truth. 
we as scientists, I, I studied computer science. Mm -hmm. I have a graduate degree in computer science as well. Um, I taught it at the university for years in graduate business classes as well. I have more graduate work in business. Uh, we, don't, we don't use absolutes when we teach that. We say, this is what happens when you do this. If you want to make a computer program, if you want to make exactly. a program for telephones, yeah. Yeah. whatever you do, you follow laws. Yeah. And this is the way it always mm. works. Mm. And, and then suddenly we get to uh, the spiritual, the psychological, th psychiatric part. I'm a registered nurse, so I've dealt with psychiatric patients and others. Suddenly, relativism? I'm sorry. Mm. It's, it's all smoke. Mm. In reality, everything in life, be it, be it uh, physical laws, social laws, everything, they're, they're absolute truths. Well, so does it mean that you have a truth meter? How do you measure your truth? When it comes to spiritual truth, yeah. reality, it's God's word. It's God's word. God's word. Okay. Now, when, now, we work in, in, in the Philippines. We have a very large work throughout the Philippines. We have in all North, Central, and South Philippines. We operate aircraft, helicopters, medical work, media. Mm. And we work many, in many places with in southern Philippines, especially with Muslim populations. And there are radical Muslims with machine guns and guerrillas. And we go up and we work with them. And uh, the mosques are open to us. They invite us into our mosques. They in the mosque, in a Yes, Muslim. absolutely, wow. two weeks. And they come, and then, and then we show them fr from the Quran, uh, we show them that even the Quran supports Jesus mm. Christ as, as a prophet. prophet yeah. And if he's a prophet, then he is a true prophet. Mm. And if he's a true prophet, then we can go to what Jesus Christ said and we can believe what it says. So when we get done, everybody gets a Quran in English because most of them have Quran in Arabic and they don't read Arabic, mm. they read Indonesian, yeah, right? Yeah. Or, Phil uh, or Indonesian, I'm sorry, that's in Indonesia. We also broadcast nationwide in Indonesia, the largest Muslim country in the world. And we have good support there. We give it to them in English or Tagalog. And so they have a Quran, now they can read. And we can show them what the Quran says. And then we give them a Bible in that same language. And they take pictures. Mm. Here's their machine gun, and they have a Bible and a Quran. Wow. Now they say, they apologize, and they say, we're sorry we persecuted. Mm. Uh, we persecuted you before. Now we understand that the Bible expresses truth, too. We know that the Quran has uh, the truth about Jesus Christ, that he was a prophet, but we, t we show that Jesus himself, mm. as a prophet, said he was, came from God. Yeah. And he, he's the son of <coughs> God. Well, if he's a true prophet, then what he said is true. Mm. So what did he say? So we lead them that way, and they're very impressed. And they say the only thing we, wh what they really appreciate about Seventh-day Adventists is that Seventh-day Adventists share the same belief on diet. No, no unclean meats, no pork, you know. And in fact, we're better at diet than they are most of the time. They eat things that they know they shouldn't, and we try to be mm. more strict on our diet than they are. So they really appreciate that we share that, that, that belief. And, and of course, they do say one thing. Many Christians don't know how to dress correctly, women especially. They say, you're Christian, but you don't dress like a Christian. You dress like the world. Women should wear appropriate dresses that cover the body. And many Christians in this world today, I mean, I'm sure in Denmark, there's, there's Christian women that dress like the world mm -hmm. in the church, outside of the church. Many claim to be Lutheran, but they don't dress like Martin Luther would have dressed mm. that, or his wife. They dress like any, any worldly person would dress. So they say, if you're going to come to our mosque, your women have to be dressed appropriately. I appreciate that about the Muslims, that they have appropriate mm. dress. Now, I don't necessarily mean that, that you have to cover your face and all of that, but at least cover the body, mm. right? So you don't tempt anybody just because you're walking down the street. Mm. And so we men know what that means. So uh, that's why I believe that God's word is absolute truth, and we can look to it, and what it says, we can believe, we can base our faith on, we can base our actions and decisions on, and it's not human opinion because human opinions are everywhere. We need God's word to be the sounding board. No church, no pope, no king, no priest, no pastor has the right to have authority about truth unless it's, unless it's supported by the Bible. So, well, some people will say, well, that's fine with you. That's your choice to believe uh, that the Bible is true. Do you, can you tell us some very good, what really makes you, what is the basis that made you believe that the Bible is God's word and it's true? I would because call it empirical, empirical yeah. evidence. Yeah. Uh, today we live in a world that it's relativism, it's true. It's all relative, but that's not really the real world. Mm. Everything in the universe is, is, uh, can be tested empirically. 
I mean, it's the things that you can test, that physically we have access to. We can't test the stars, we can't go there, but we, can, we have evidence that we can measure. And everything about science is measurable. That's part, of the, that's part of what makes modern science acceptable is that if you can measure it and repeat it, you get the same results every time. Why? It's not relative. One day the speed of light is one speed and the next day at a different speed. Mm. No, it's always an absolute. Even though there's slight modifications over time and gravity's change and the, mm. the magnetic north changes slightly, that's following the laws as well of physics, mm. which are measurable and repeatable. This is important. And well, in, in, in t today in society, the same thing. If the Bible says something, it should be measurable. It should be able to confirm it. And that's, that, that's the whole point about God's word. It is measurable. It is confirmable. And if you follow it, you will find evidence. Now, if you want to deny truth, I know there's some Germans who deny there ever was a Second World War and that no Jews died in Germany. Well, when it comes to science, which way would you go? Would you measure Bible against science or science against Bible? Well, the God of the Bible is the God of science. They go hand in hand. Uh, some of our greatest scientists uh, in the world, uh, that, 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 that the law of gravity, mm. <laughs> it wasn't developed by an atheist. Uh, and that the greatest scientists in the world, many of them were believers. And that there is no different, that the Bible can be trusted scientifically, just like you can trust, but, but is it, this is only spiritual, this is physical. Mm. No, the Bible reflects God's word as the creator of all the physical world that we know, the physical universe. Mm. So they both go hand in hand. There is no conflict between mm. them. We just have to understand that this is primarily spiritual, but it, when it talks about physical things, it's talking about truth. And it's true that when, when I cook a meal, you can say, what does that have to do with the Bible? That has a lot to do with the Bible. The Bible tells you what meats are clean and unclean. And today we can verify mm. that those who, those who follow biblical standards on food live longer than those who don't. Mm. So you say, there's a direct relation between truth in the physical world and the Bible. So the God of the Bible is the, is the God, the creator of all science. Well, the main reason why I'm asking you this mm. question, it's, it's more likely to, to show the audience and whoever would like to, to listen to this or to see this uh, interview where you come from. And what is your basis? Uh, how do you take your decisions? It's th this is uh, for example, for Dr. Semmelweis was, was, was a physician, uh, obstetrician in Austria. And, and he b decided one day, in those days, they never washed their hands. Yeah, the surgeons yeah. would never do that. So he decided one day he would follow the biblical principles and start washing his hands before mm. checking the different patients. And to his surprise, instead of 50% death rate, it went down to uh, less than 2%. Yeah. He couldn't explain it. The, 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 surgical, the, the physicians were, were enraged mm. that he would follow that and they took away his license, and he died in ignominy. Hmm. And why? Now today, modern, modern surgery, I've been in surgeries many times as a nurse. I've been in uh, surgeries for general surgery. I've been in surgeries uh, that involve uh, 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 C-sections with the baby, and I would be responsible to resuscitate the baby after a delivery like that. And I've been into many, and all of them follow modern hmm. uh, scientific rules, and they come from originally from the Bible. So. There is no conflict, and I, I would like to propose <laughs> that the closer we get to the Bible, the more we will understand the God of science. And the more we understand God of science, the more we will understand creation. So would you confirm that whatever you do, it's actually you go back to the Bible and you're doing your very best to align yourself with the God of the Bible and the spirit of prophecy? Absolutely. That, I would say that completely. And even though I'm not a chemist or a physicist, uh, obviously as a registered nurse, mm. obviously as a... Uh, uh, information a scientist and uh, a uh, technician um, and as a business everything I've done I do is based on biblical principles and you cannot do science today unless you believe in absolutes and I don't know why society is believing the fact that everything is relative when the rest of the world you can't send a rocket to 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 space you can't send a space shuttle to maybe space maybe there is no space some people some people <laughs> say that but the truth is yeah. We probably haven't been told yeah. the whole truth by, by yeah. everybody. Uh, with everybody, they say they walked on the moon. Well, now they look at it and say, really, did they walk on the moon? Mm. There's, there's a lot of room to, to believe that maybe we've not been told the whole mm. thing. And pr I'm sure we haven't. Yeah. But, but, but that doesn't mean there's no space. Uh, the space is out there. Can we go through space? That's a different story. Mm. Is it out there? Well, we can see it. We can observe it. We can measure the yeah. movements. But uh, on the other hand, 
On the other hand, we don't really understand it as much as we should, but what we do understand is that it's, there's absolutes. Everything around us, mm. is, you, you jump out of an airplane, the acceleration of gravity, mixing of chemicals, creation of, of different things, all follow absolute rules. Mm. And bacteria, multiplication, antibiotics, medicine, surgery, absolute rules. And, and so why in the spiritual world and in the psych psych psychological social world, mm. why we don't have that? How important would you say in mm. your experience, in your life, is the spirit of prophecy throughout the Bible and in the time that we live in? Well, I, at, at this point now, we're looking more at those who understand what the spirit of prophecy is, especially to those that are church members. We know that the spirit of prophecy is something that the Bible promises to as part of the last generation, as mm. part of God's people, they would receive the Spirit of God, would, would impress uh, uh, people, would impress others to understand and interpret the future as well. In pro the Bible is a prophetic book. Uh, you can read the, all about the future in, in, in the Bible. And as you read in the f about the future, you can interpret from the past, you can understand the future, but it does give future events that are going to happen in rapid order. Uh, Daniel was given, Daniel the prophet, was given a view of the whole history of the world from, from Nebuchadnezzar all the way to the coming of Jesus. And the Revelation is another prophetic book which shares in, and the, the promise is made that in the last generation, God would put in Joel too, he would pour out his spirits and men and women would prophesy. Mm. Uh, that means that whenever God does something in the future, he's going to do it in accordance with his revealed will in the past. He's never going to contradict himself. He's not going to have a prophet come and say, strange things that God has never said. You can't find it. In it. All prophetic uh, gifts have to be measured by the Bible. So the spirit of prophecy through, the, through Ellen G. White, uh, modern medicine, uh, principles of health, were revealed over 100 years ago to Ellen G. White. And Dr. Kellogg from Kellogg's Corn Flakes, which all of us know about Kellogg's, has affected the whole world. That came out of the principles from the spirit of prophecy as revealed to Ellen G. White. Uh, the, fact that, the fact that many reject it it's only because they don't like what she says. The truth is, it's truth. Hmm. God revealed it. Light is there. It's God's will. All prophecy, all prophets should be measured by the Bible. So rejecting the spirit of prophecy, hmm. which according to what you're saying, is part of the package of being a Seventh-day Adventist. It comes with a package. It comes with a package. What, is, what, are, what do you, would you say are the consequences of taking out the spirit of prophecy? Well, I was in the Philippines, uh, at the, you know, at the uh, Central Pacific Union University, and I was speaking to all the theology students and the professors there, and they asked a question. They said, uh, we can <coughs> trust the Bible as the greater light, but even, even uh, Sister White said that the spirit of prophecy, you might say, let me just take this as an example, is a lesser light. So why do we have to pay attention to the lesser light when we have, we the, have greater the greater light? light. That's, yes. a, that's a question, right? Uh, my question was, which of the prophets ever said they were a greater light? None of the prophets were a greater light. Mm. Not Moses, not Daniel, not Jeremiah, Isaiah. None of them were greater lights. All of them were lesser lights. But when you put them all together, you have the greater light. So Sister White was one of the lesser lights. And she's a prophet of God. The same angel, Gabriel, that spoke to Daniel, spoke to Ellen G. White. The same God. That's, it's, it, nothing has changed. The only difference is that she had a special function to prepare the last generation and to help us to prevent deceptions. For example, I know Catholic priests. Jesuit priests, and they believe Ellen G. White, and they say she is a prophet of God. But if you pay attention to that, then you will not be, then you will not be, we will not be able to, to have you believe the things that we want the public to believe. If you believe the spirit of prophecy, then you cannot be deceived. But if you read the spirit of prophecy and believe it, you are protected against the, the human traditions that we're trying to bring in to the world. So here we have you might say unbelievers who believe, and we have church members who don't believe. Hmm. But the truth is, those who believe are greatly blessed, just like in, in, uh, in uh, Second Chronicles uh, chapter 20, uh, uh, good king Sennacherib, a good king um, Jehoshaphat sa said, to, said to his people, believe the prophets and so shall ye hmm. prosper. The prophet stood up and said, you will find the enemy coming to this valley, go attack them, you will not have to fight, the battle is the Lord's. And they put the choir up front instead, mm. of the, instead of the warriors. And they went singing to the victory because they believed the prophets. When they got there, everybody was dead. All the enemies fought among mm. each other. You have to believe the prophets and obey them 
if you're going to have the benefits. So the consequences are are fatal. Fatal. The consequences are fatal. This is a very interesting and important study because it's fatal and this is not the aim uh, of our interview here. Uh, I would recommend people, and I guess mm -hmm. you do, there are a lot of uh, good, uh, interesting, not just sermons, but seminars about the spirit of prophecy, about the LNG White. Uh, the aim of my question was just to emphasize how important the spirit of prophecy is for you as a Seventh-day Adventist, but also for the ministry, uh, ministries and all the projects that you're running around the world. Well, I, would, I consider the spirit of prophecy to be just as valid as the Bible because it's part of the revelation and the light God has given through his prophets to the world. It has the same authority. Mm. So even though she said it was a lesser light, all the prophets are lesser light. None of them are the greater. Only Jesus Christ exactly. is the greater light. Yeah. So the, the accumulation of all the <coughs> light of the lesser prophets plus the greater light, Jesus Christ, uh, makes a total of revelation that God has given to us. And I've, I can... I, uh, accept the spirit of prophecy with the same value as the Bible. It has a little bit different function. The, the present, uh, the spirit of prophecy is not to create doctrine. The spirit of prophecy is to prepare us for the last generation to receive Jesus Christ and prepare us physically, mentally, spiritually, and to clearly outline the expectations that God has in his last generation for us to finish the work. And if you reject it, we just need to know. If you reject the spirit of prophecy, you will be deceived. Mm. In fact, she says it very clearly. Those who reject the spirit of pro prophecy will be deceived and will join the enemy and march under the banner of the enemy. So, so I, I want all Seventh-day Adventists mm. especially to understand the rejection of the spirit of prophecy is certain death. You can, be, you can say, I'm insulted. I, I, I don't want to hear that. You can say that if you want, but it's the truth. It's judgmental. Yeah, but that's, that's what, it's, that's mm. what it, God said. Who is she to say so and so? She, it's God who says it. Exactly. Well, that's pretty straightforward. It's yeah. uh, both. If you statement. reject the spirit yeah. of prophecy, you will be lost. Mm. How would you drive your ministry without the spirit of prophecy? Would that be possible? Well, before the well, the, with the spirit of prophecy is the Bible. Mm. <laughs> all 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 the revelations came through the inspiration of the uh, of the Holy Spirit, uh, which is the spirit of prophecy, and this is just a continuation. Exactly. So, if you want to reject the spirit of prophecy. She says it herself. If you reject the spirit of prophecy, you're going to reject the whole Bible eventually. So, of course you will, mm. because this is also the spirit of prophecy. The Bible was inspired by God through men inspired, impressed of God to write. They didn't write what they wanted to. Mm. They wrote what God told them to. Mm. So, so, if you reject the spirit of prophecy, you're re re rejecting everything. And if you reject this, you cannot be saved. Yes, exactly. What's, mm. uh, what's left? There's nothing left. Uh, relativism is left. Mm. Uh, relativism is exactly what you get when you reject a standard. Exactly, and that was actually my point because uh, mm. I believe that people, it's a choice to choose to go away from a being, uh, to, to believe in absolute truth uh, because if you believe in absolute truth, there are standards. There are moral requirements. Isn't that so? That's correct. Okay. Absolutely. If you believe in a, in, a, in a relative truth that you can make your own truth, you can make your own moral. There's yeah, nobody unfortunately, there. Unfortunately, you don't find out the consequences till after. It's too late. Li after Sometimes. It's too late. Yeah. Because um, if you do that, you can live your life, and only when it's over, then you find out if you were right or wrong. Yeah. And and uh, but scientists don't do that. Scientists live with absolute truth. It's only the society that believes they can get away with mm. uh, with relative truth. I know you as a person. Uh, you are also having an experience-based relationship with the Bible. Uh, on a real life. So this is not just theory, this is not just something you believe uh, because you believe uh, the Bible is truth, but you have an experience based on your daily life and all the countries you've been to, you have many experiences and we don't have time to go through all of them right now. Uh, Maybe I should just mention some of them real quickly. Um, because I gave my, my life into service mm. and going to difficult areas of the world, I've been hijacked, I've been imprisoned, I've been beaten. I've I've been assaulted by by armed robbers. I've been assaulted by by armed men many times. Uh, I have s my my angels have appeared at my side to protect me, to freeze all the gang members, to take me out of the assault many many times without me recognizing who they were. All of a sudden, I realize they just appeared out of nowhere. They froze everybody. They pulled me out, and so I've experienced this. And so I am a firm believer that exactly what the Bible says mm -hmm. is exactly when. 
uh, when, when the Bible promises that God will send his angels to protect you and surround you, that's exactly what he means. Mm. I count on it. I'm a pilot. I fly into jungle areas where there's gorillas. I fly into areas that are armed. I fly into very dangerous situations. I work in dangerous situations. I've had people waving machetes over my back saying they were going to cut my head off. And I just turn my back to them and I say, well, if they're going to cut my head, I guess I, that's up to God. Mm. I, I've, in Venezuela, uh, I was bringing uh, some funds, a donation to, to the church to build a church down there that came from Europe. I had 8,000 euros in my pocket. And, and I was coming back after being in Europe for a while. And I didn't realize the government was turning more and more, more radical and they had forbidden foreign cash. Anybody caught with foreign cash, automatically the police could take it and the guards could take it from you. Of course, they put it in their own pocket, but it, it was, they made it illegal to carry foreign mm. cash. So here I came with 8,000 euros in my pocket, going to the union board meetings, uh, planning to give the treasurer the money to build a, the little church. And I didn't know anything and the police boarded, uh, boarded uh, the bus they stood right before me. I smiled at them. I was just waiting to say good morning. But they stood right there in front of me. They looked over my shoulders and said, all of you all, get off the bus. But they didn't look at me. So I figured they were talking to them. And, and they looked through everything, every magazine, every page, every book people had. I could just see them going like this, shaking the book to see if anything would fall out. They looked through all the pages. I said, what are they doing? They were looking for money hmm. and something. And they looked through everybody. And they finally said, okay, you can get back on. They came back on the bus. They stood right in front of me. And they told the bus driver, we didn't find anything, you can leave. So they didn't see They you. never saw me. They, I would be the first one they would look at. Oh, there's a foreigner. That guy's not from here. He probably has oh, money. Oh. They never saw me. Twice, three policemen stood in front of me, and they never made eye contact with me. That's impossible. Hmm. The first person they should see was me. And I kept on going innocently. And when I got to the union, I gave the treasurer the money. He said, just, just be glad you didn't get stopped by the police. They would have taken your money. I said, we, could, we did get stopped. <laughs> And he said, well, why didn't they take your money? I never made eye contact with him. I was sitting there waiting to say hello. They never saw me. Mm. And I realized God protects us in many, many mm. ways. So nobody can tell me the Bible's not true. Mm. I live by it. I work by it. I, I depend on the promises that are there. Praise God. And when you're flying mm -hmm. into these uh, locations, into, th into the jungle, how do you handle that? Do you call in security first? <laughs> uh, I was in Papua New Guinea. Uh, some uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, they took me to an area way up in the mountains, and I had heard the worst things of PNG, which they call Papua New Guinea PNG for short. And I heard that if you kill a pig, you promptly have to get out if you run over a pig, uh, and you pay for it. If you kill a person, they will promptly kill the driver. They don't wait for justice. Mm. Immediately they execute justice right there. So you don't you don't you have to drive carefully. Mm. Well, this driver was driving up there as fast as he could drive. Uh, uh, my wife and I were, were, she was with me, and, uh, and we were just saying, man, I hope they don't kill anybody, <laughs> because they have to kill yeah. the driver. But he was going as fast as he could drive up to the little villages, and at least he didn't kill any pigs either. <laughs> but when we got there, we had the whole week there, and we noticed that there was always a guard at our side. Uh, every time, you know, you don't notice it until you try to, I'm, gonna ju I'm just going to go across the road to get a picture. Boom, there was somebody at our side. And we realized they're, they're watching us. And finally later I said, why are, you, why are you always guarding us? They said, there's never been any white people in this village. Hmm. This is the first time the white people all come here with the armed guards inside of armed cars with machine guns. Nobody has ever come. And you come unarmed and you come just to meet the people and you preach all week and then you help with... I joined five other pastors in a baptism in a cold creek that I had there. And we baptized for an hour, uh, a long line of people. And... Uh, and then we had to greet everybody. They said, no white man ever comes up into the mountains without, a, without being armed. Mm. But we weren't afraid at all. Mm. We just know that the angels are watching over us. W when was that going on? Uh, that was a couple of years ago. A couple of years uh -huh. ago. About okay. two years. Okay. So, so when you go mm. to a, a, a new location which you've never been before, uh, do you, how much preparation would you do? Uh, as far as security? Mm. None. None. No, I'm, I'm surrounded all the time. Mm. I have security 24-7 mm. and invisible security. Mm. And God has saved my life so many times, I don't have to doubt it. Mm. I've seen it happen. If he allows something to happen, it's because he allowed it. Mm. I go to Colombia. We go to Colombia. We work all over the country. Uh, Maranatha is an organization that builds churches all over the world. They never go to Colombia. 
and our team was recently went in Colombia and built some churches. Mm. And, and we help the people we go, and they said, don't you need security? No. Mm. We just go into very dangerous areas, and we work. Uh, we, we, don't, we're not, we don't act stupid when there's, when there's active warfare going on or mm. where there is an area that's closed off to normal traffic. We don't try to go into it. Mm. But I'm saying we don't run around with bodyguards and protection. Mm. Um, that's one thing, I, one thing I appreciated about one thing I appreciated about our president, Ted Wilson, when he became president, the previous president to him was always surrounded by bodyguards. Really? As soon as Ted Wilson was elected, mm. he sent them home. Mm. I said, very good. Mm. That shows confidence in God. Instead of physical armed men walking around you everywhere, why? Mm. When you have angels. Exactly. And Pastor Ted Wilson showed that night that when he was mm. elected, when he preached, he sent all the bodyguards home. Mm. We're not going to pay for that. Go home. Exactly. And so yeah. that's, that, that's how I act. Mm. I... I believe that God has his angels surrounding us all the time, and we can go into dangerous situations mm. if God calls us to do that, mm. and we can depend on his care. And that, that's important to, to add mm. that if God's calling us there, it's because he has a mission, and, that's right. and he's going to be with us. That's right. And our part is to? Just obey. Exactly. So you, you mentioned earlier to me that you're operating in 97 countries? Uh, 94 countries. 94 uh -huh. countries, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, what kind of missions do you have in in these countries? Um, some countries we have aviation, like we have about 40-something aircraft that mm. operate. Um, and we have organizations in each country and nonprofit corporations mm. that own the assets and are run by boards in each mm. country. We don't have a central organization mm -hmm. that runs everything. Mm. We try to decentralize. So, so for example, here, uh, our organization in the U.S. is unrelated to legally to this organization, but yet we came and helped to start it, and, and you accepted the invitation to lead out, and that God led, but uh, legally, w there's no relation, and so in every country, we have different organizations, different people running things, but we're all a family. Mm. We all operate together. We all share together. We all help each other, just like if we were lived different houses, but we're all brothers and mm. sisters, right? So, so we operate some with media, some with aviation, some with schools, medical work, medical launches, and so on. Yeah. This is, uh, this is wonderful, mm. and, and it, it's just so amazing to see how God is leading actually people all over the world. And I'm, I'm thinking about the recently ministry that you've been helping to start in Japan. Uh, this is exciting. Yeah. Japan is the biggest city in the world. Tokyo is nearly 38 million people, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and most of them have never even heard the name of Jesus. Mm. Uh, they're not a Christian country. They're usually a Buddhist country. So they don't even know what Jesus is. So we've been praying for a long time to go in. I targeted the three biggest countries in the world, Tokyo, Sao Paulo, and Mexico mm. City. And in Mexico City, we're getting a license, and uh, we're working with the government. It was, that's an incredible story by itself, which I'll probably tell maybe mm. this yeah. weekend, uh, because they wanted, they wanted very, 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 they're very strict on the amount of finances that you had to have before you were allowed into into that group of people that run mm. TV stations. And so I accepted the appointment. My team was scared, but I'll tell the story how God did that. But Mexico City and Sao Paulo, we're working in, in Brazil. We have a very nice TV station. If any of you, any of the, the viewers speak Portuguese, uh, it would be terceroangel.com. And uh, Third Angel is called there. And uh, uh, they, they, uh, it's, it's run very well. We broadcast it in different cities, but Brazil is so big, uh, we have an opportunity to broadcast in 300 cities. And we're, we're praying for the resources that God will give it to us so we can broadcast on open television stations in 300 cities of Brazil. Wonderful, yeah. And, and that's because the, the internet mm. connection is not as good as, as in Europe. Yeah, all up and down the rivers and the jungles, there's no internet. Mm. So, so ju just, just the amount of dishes, big mm. dishes, uh, there's 40 million. Wow. 40 million large sea band dishes in Brazil. in Brazil where people along the rivers and the jungles and everything can mm. receive live programming, mm. but they don't have internet. So this is the best way to actually to promote and to preach and to spread the message is through TV. Yeah, for the jungles. And satellite. TV and satellite, mm. and then for the cities, you can use, of course, we have internet as well. Mm. Uh, people like uh, watch us in Angola and mm. Mozambique, they speak Portuguese there, and we're a very big influence on the African countries mm. that speak Portuguese. Uh, Portugal as well, uh, and Brazil. Uh, but but in Brazil itself, we are trying aggressively to place it on, on transmission stations all over the country. But mm. uh, just electric bill 
would run would run a massive amount. So exactly. God has to yeah. open up that door for us yet. So wherever you go, you're trying mm -hmm. to cooperate and to work with uh, local uh, people, local churches, Seventh-day Adventist churches, and within the context of the Seventh-day Adventist message. Well, it, it's, a, it's the Adventist message that, that we've had for 150 mm -hmm. years, not that the historical Seventh-day Adventist message. The historical Seventh-day Adventist yeah. mes mission, and that is to prepare the world for Jesus' second coming. Mm -hmm. But we, we preach the, what we have always known to be the pillars of our faith. Uh, of course, let's, let's imagine a second, Michael. Let's imagine that, that Satan knows what God's, God is trying to do. What would you expect Satan to do? You would expect, first of all, to distract the world with other things, movies mm -hmm. and everything, and media and entertainment and music and rock music everywhere, just to distract them so they don't have any time to ever hear the truth. Okay, but then there's a people called Seventh-day Adventists that are called by God. Now, Seventh-day Adventists, just for, the, uh, for clarity purposes, Seventh-day Adventists know that we're only a very small part of God's people. We know God has peop uh, children in all the churches. We know that. In fact, we're only a small part of all of God's children mm -hmm. in the world. But we have a very special mission. The mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is to make the world aware that Jesus is coming soon and to prepare them spiritually and physically. That's why we have a health message. That's why we have so many hospitals, uh, physically and spiritually, to be ready for that last final conflict. Mm. That's our mission. Now, what would Satan do? What would the enemy of God do? Well, he would seek to derail the church from its mission. Any enemy would do that. How do you do that? The same way, distracting unbelief, the way Israel got distracted. And when Jesus came, they didn't even recognize their own Messiah. Compromising. Right? They killed him. Mm. Compromising, focusing on human traditions, human authority over God's authority, where we take the, we take the word of a human administrator over, over a direct, clear statement from mm. God's word or the spirit of prophecy, to where human authority has more authority than God himself. Mm. Uh, this, is, this is what Rome does. This is what Protestant churches have done. This is what many Seventh-day Adventist churches are doing. Human authority says this, and we will do what they say, regardless of what it's clear hmm. in God's word. So when you do that, you just need to know that God is not your God. Hmm. You're, you're, At least not the God of the, the Bible. The human is your God. Yeah. Hmm. You're, you're serving a human religion, not God's. Because in God's religion, in God's, uh, in God's church, the, God's word has ultimate authority. This is one of the principles of Protestantism. And here in Denmark, the Pope comes to Denmark and he celebrates the death of Protestantism. It was Sweden, sorry. It he came to Sweden? Sweden yeah. I thought he came to Denmark. No, no he didn't Sweden. come. To, I'm sorry, yeah. I'm sorry. I guess he came initially here and then he ended up... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, my, you're right. He came to Sweden. But he, why Scandinavia? Hmm. Well, most of us here say we're Lutheran, right? Th doesn't Denmark yeah. mainly Lutheran? Claim, yes. Claim, yeah. They claim they're Lutheran. And, and Norway, is Sweden also? Yes. Okay. So the Scandinavian countries have basically the Lutheran church as their main church. Well, the Lutheran church was based on Protestant mm. principles. Not any longer. Not any longer. At least officially. Well, what about the Adventist church? Mm. The same problem. The, uh, where are the Protestants? Who is protesting? And what are the pillars of Protestantism? The pillars are sola scriptura. All doctrine must come, must be based on scripture. Mm. Not a pope, not a king, mm. not a priest, not a pastor. Or working policies. Or working policies. Mm. It's based on God's word. And your conscience is tied to this, not human authority. And if your conscience is tied to this, and there's no king, priest, mm. pope, or authority that can contradict and control your conscience. Mm. Those are the principles, the two pillars of Protestantism. So it seems that, that is, this is a tactic of, mm. of the enemy to bring conflict in between, let's say, your ministries or, or the projects that you're trying to start all over the world because you're doing your very best to stay focused and, and to stay based on the foundation of, of the Bible and, and the spirit of prophecy. I, is that correct. a correct Yes, and, and it's, it's natural mm. that there would be opposition. Mm. But why is it coming from inside? Because Again, the spirit of prophecy told yeah. us that's where the biggest risk mm. is. Because the, uh, opposition is more effective from mm. the inside. If you, if you train your theologians mm. and you train your administrators over generations to respect human authority above the Bible, mm. they will try to enforce that in the churches. And what you have is another Rome church. Rome Maybe church. because we are not trained to watch our back. <laughs> we still try to see how it's, it's coming from, from the outside. 
uh, the enemy is outside, the attack is going to come from the outside, from uh, whatever institution is going to be against the Seventh-day Adventists or the Sabbath keepers. Rome has been very subtle. Mm. It has learned that the best way is to attack from the inside mm. by training pastors and leaders, mm. uh, spiritual leaders and administrators, to obey human authority. Mm. If you do that, then it's just a job. A pastor mm. only has a job. Uh, to keep your job, you just obey the president. Mm. And that president obeys the other president. And you just, uh, you just simply obey human authority mm. and you keep your job. I was in Holland ex some years ago. You know that uh, Holland, is like, uh, uh, like France, has islands in the Caribbean. The Dutch islands yeah. and the French islands. Well, I work in all those islands too. And uh, I know them when, when I was working in the, I was working in the Venezuela F Dutch Antilles Union for years. They were part of my territory. I would go and work among the Dutch islands. Uh, they now have their own union, but when I was working, it was part of my union. So I was uh, a department director, so I would go and work among uh, those islands. And it was interesting, many of them would train under theology in our own universities, but then they would come to Holland to serve. Well, Holland has a very different type of philosophy than the Dutch islands do in the Caribbean, mm. which are more conservative. So I was talking to a pastor from Curacao, a Dutch island, and he was pastoring a church, a rather large church in, in Holland, and he asked me the question. He said, uh, I'm not allowed to talk against fornication. I'm not allowed to talk about young people living together. I can't talk about adultery. I can't talk about homosexuality. I'm supposed to just keep my mouth shut. And I said, but you know what the truth is. What does the Bible say about mm. it? I know, but if I talk about it, I lose my job. Oh, it's about your job, is it? Well, very good. Keep your job and go to hell then. Hmm. He goes, why do you say that? Because God's not going to welcome you to mm. heaven unless you preach Bible truth. Mm. I said, but if you want God's uh, approbation, you have to preach what's in the mm. Bible. And if you, lo you lose your job, go back and work in Curacao. But you have to, do, you have to understand, a pastor who, who puts human authority above Bible mm. authority is not going to receive the welcome in heaven. So it's about authority. It's about authority, human or God's authority. Mm. It's always been. Mm. The, it's always been that. What do you think the Pope is? Human authority. Mm. Human authority, but he has a very high political position. But when he speaks, he expects everybody to obey. Mm. But what if the Bible says something different? That's what Protestantism mm. was about. What do you think Martin Luther was about? Mm. He was saying the Pope doesn't have authority over God's word. Sola Scriptura. So only the Bible. And so uh, Martin Luther uh, protested. He was thrown out of the church, excommunicated, and that's where the Lutheran church was born. But even the Lutheran church today has forgotten who Martin Luther is. Mm. And and they have agreed to work with Rome again. Well, Martin Luther would yeah. roll over in his grave today mm. if he knew that. Mm. You know, we, it's, it's, about, it's not about belonging to a, a denomination. Mm. You can never be saved by belonging to that church or that church or that church. You are, you're saved by a relationship mm. with Jesus Christ. Mm. And if you are obedient and submissive and surrender to Jesus Christ, he will show you truth and he will follow you to salvation. Mm. But if you just join a church and blindly follow a church, you're not going to end up in heaven. Mm. Well, one of the last questions, I mm. just want to touch a little bit about the financial part of supporting of uh, your ministries. And the reason I'm doing that is because, uh, as, as you know, there are a lot of rumors out there about how you finance the projects and money in and out. And I'm not going to ask you to, to reveal, uh, uh, you know, incomes and outcomes and so on. But... Uh, as, as a strong believer in, in the spirit of prophecy and the Bible, uh, and as a very faithful person, uh, you have been, uh, in my experience and what I've learned from, from uh, your life, uh, you have been part of financing uh, pretty big projects around the world. Uh, but we have nothing to hide, so I don't no. mind being transparent. <laughs> and besides, besides our, in most countries, all mm. our finances are public record anyway. Mm. Because a nonprofit corporation has is a public organization, yeah, yeah. so uh, our biggest one is in the U.S. But we have, like I say, 94 countries and organizations in most of those countries, and it's a, it's a, r a public record. So mm. we have nothing to hide. Mm. Our philosophy is most most important. Mm. If somebody really wants to know the numbers, just go to just go mm. look uh, look it up on look the internet. Online, yes, good point. You can yeah. tell public record, uh, and so we um, our philosophy is this. If God owns all the gold and the silver, Haggai 2.8 says, I own all the silver and the gold, saith the Lord. If he owns everything, then he is w able to finance his own work. Mm. 
And I could go to the church and I could say, please finance me, please help me. And they would say, oh, we don't have enough or we have enough. I was in Switzerland one time and, and they said, be sure not to ask anybody uh, for an offering. Hmm. I said, I never ask for an offering. When I speak, I just leave it up to people. I never mention it. I, don't, I didn't come here for money. I came here to share encouragement hmm. and to serve the Lord. But later I discovered that Switzerland's one of the richest conferences hmm. we have in the world. Hmm. They have more in reserves. They could finance their work without a single offering. They could go on for 10 years without even anybody oh, giving anything. Yeah, yeah. But for them to say, don't ask for money, it's like the philosophy is, hold on to what you have and don't share it. Hmm. But the Bible says, given it shall be given unto you, right? Hmm. So I believe that the more you give to others, the more you receive. And so if I give everything I have, I can depend on God to give me what I need. Hmm. So I place myself, my resources, my time, my influence in God's work. And now it's up to him mm. to give me what I need, food, mm. money, gasoline for the airplane, maintenance, safety, protection. And so we started that way 22 years ago in Guyana. And from there we went to Venezuela and other countries and now it's in 94 countries and growing. Um, but the philosophy is that just trust the Lord. Don't ask for money. Mm. Just leave that in God's hands and uh, he will finance his own work. Mm -hmm. Now, God usually uses people. Why? Because he wants to bless them. If you give to God's work, you will be blessed. God will, there's a blessing attached to financing God's work. But he, it doesn't have to be my ministry. It could be a local evangelistic effort in your own church. Mm. It could be a Bible worker that you have. It could be another poor family that needs help. That's between you and God. Mm. But the more we give, the more we receive. Mm. That's a biblical principle. That's a biblical principle. And, and all church members and all children of God need to know mm. that the more generous you are with God's work, the more generous God is with you. And it's not just the tithe. It's not just the tithe. Most mm. of it is offering. Tithe is only 10%. Mm. Many people argue about the tithe. That's only 10%. Mm. You have 90% left to manage yourself mm. for God's work. Mm. So if you give 10% faithfully to the church, fine. Mm. Then use the other 90% mm. for your own needs and God's work. Mm. And so the truth, the truth is tithing is somewhat irrelevant. Mm. But everybody wants to fight over 10%. No, I don't fight over 10%. Mm. Just be faithful with, with your tithe. Use it to support God's work and use the other 90% to help also. Mm. And that is in your own administration. So, so our finances uh, are mainly this way. Uh, when somebody gives money to a specific project, 100% of that money goes to that project. We don't take a percentage out for administration. We don't take for handling or anything. Mm. Whatever reaches our hands goes into that same project. And how do we pay our bills? That's God's problem. Mm. You trust God for your money. I'll trust God for my money. And if they give me $1,000 for your project, you will get $1,000 or 1,000 euros, whatever it is that, that is given. You will get all of it because that's not my money. It was given for your ministry. And we don't say, well, because I'm managing it and we have to cover mm. overheads and we'll take 2% out and give you the rest. M many ministries take 1% or 2% out. Some take more than mm. that just for managing it. Mm. We don't take anything out. Yeah. We trust God to help us pay our electric b bills and the mortgages and everything according to what he wants to give mm. us. And if anything, most 90, I would say more than 90% of donations that we get are specific donations for specific projects. Mm. And so that, that goes to the projects and we, we try to run everything else with what's left. So it's not because you have a big bank account uh, somewhere in, in, in the world and, and from there you just take portions for... We're bankrupt every month. Hmm. Every month we use everything that we get. Hmm. Almost, almost down to zero every month. And, and people say, oh, come on. I was talking to a well-known Adventist pastor and he said, well, how much money do you get? I said, well, the, the joint, I told him the exact numbers, what we get. You can't do all of that with that much. You mm. must be having some other money coming in. Mm. No. Mm. But we work with volunteers. Mm. Volunteers means that I don't get a salary. I don't get a salary. Nobody pays me a fixed amount every month. I don't have a retirement, a medical insurance plan. Mm. Uh, if I lived in a certain, even North America, for years everybody is required mm. to be able to have their own medical insurance. But I don't, I don't get enough money to, I'm exempted because I make, I make less than $5,000 a year. My wife mainly makes it. She mm. works as a nurse whenever we're in the U.S. And uh, she probably makes around four to 5000 um, a year. Mm -hmm. And so that is personal income. And so we report it as personal income. And I'm given a place to stay. I report that as benefits given to me, a place to stay. It's, it's a value, but it's not cash. Mm. So I have a place to stay in Tennessee in the U.S. I have a place to stay in Bolivia. I have another place in, in, in Guyana. 
and that's a place where I stay, so I report it as a benefit. Hmm. But it's non-cash. I can't sell my, my bed, you know. So, so I report it to the government, and they say, you don't make enough money to, to, to pay for health insurance, so I, we've been exempted. We've never paid health insurance because we're exempted. Well, what do we do when we're sick? We're not sick. Hmm. Or if we are, it's a minor amount, a little tiny something. Mm. If it, what if it's a major surgery? Well, my wife had to have a surgery one time. She had a, an inguinal hernia, and I was doing a week of prayer for an Adventist hospital in the U.S., and the surgeon said, if you ever need anything, let us know. Well, I didn't know that the next year my wife would need surgery. So I went to the hospital, and I said, in fact, it was interesting. The uh, hospital administrator, uh, his wife was a Romanian, and, and so we enjoyed staying in their home and eating Romanian food. But we, we, were, we were there, and, and he said, uh, I called him and I said, my wife suddenly has a hernia and she needs surgery. Uh, well, let me talk to the surgeon. And the surgeon said, me charge David Gates? What would God do to me? <laughs> I will do the surgery for free. Mm. David is a man of God. And so he did the surgery, and the hospital said, we'll give you for free too. My wife went in, mm. did all the lab work, had the surgery, and we came home, zero cost. Wonderful. So, so God provides for our needs. That could have been a twenty, thirty thousand dollar bill if it, we had to pay, mm. or more. But I know in some countries, healthcare is provided free for everybody. I don't know in Denmark how it is, but, but it's, it's, it's uh, free. It's free, and not in the U.S. Mm. So, uh, I would have had to pay quite a bit of money. But, and then we, she fell down, and her arm came out of di disjoint, mm. well, and she was in a lot of pain in, in Guyana. She slipped on the pavement and fell down, and, oh. and, and the public hospital did the surgery and put it back. There was no cost there. Mm. And so we, we know that God is taking care of us, but generally speaking, we don't have any guarantees, money, bank accounts anywhere mm. that, that, that are private. Uh, and the little bit we make isn't enough to cover. But what else do we need? I have my food. I have a bed. I stayed at your house last night. Mm. You didn't charge me for the bed, and you fed me this morning. Mm. So, so not, I think not yet. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> <laughs> no. So God is providing for our mm. needs, and we find that He's well able to do that. In fact, throughout history, mm. if we look back, we when since when did people have health insurance? Mm. A thousand years ago, who had health insurance? Nobody. Mm. Most of the history of Europe, no health insurance. Just this is a modern thing, where the government provides for all your needs. The government has never provided for all the needs of all the people throughout yeah. history. So people have to find their own way to mm. survive. I'm glad I depend on God. I'm glad he's my total su sustenance, mm. and I'm not worried about the future. So, so how many percentage mm. of faith would you need to go through the projects and the way you're actually uh, financing the projects? 90%, 80%, or? Well, uh, right now it's about 100%. Mm. Uh, but I know some people come, and we tell them, if you come, we will give you your food and, and a place to stay. And he said, do you pay a salary? No, we don't pay salaries. Mm. We work with volunteerism. But if you have a personal need, we, we'll find a way. But that's not how we started, and mm. that's not the way we work. Some people, d we do give a stipend to, like a family with three people in it. We give them maybe $100, $150, or $200 a month, depending on what country they live in, what the expenses are, just for personal needs. But they already have their food, and they have their bed. So, so we leave that to God's butt. Ourselves, we try to model 100% dependence on God. Mm. Wonderful. Uh, this is the first part. We'll have a second part uh, in a few days from now. So thank you very much, David, for uh, being part of this uh, interview. And uh, God bless you and your ministry. On the uh, second part, we're going to have Aunt Becky with us. Mm. So that'll be nice to have a feminine part of you. Yeah. Because I can talk all about things. But I've had when I was in Germany one time, they went to my mm. wife and they said, can you confirm everything that he said? Because <laughs> otherwise, we just don't believe everything. Yeah. And she said, I confirm it. Okay, yeah. then we believe it. Okay. So in the mouth of two witnesses. So yeah, sometimes exactly. women want to hear a, a mm. woman. How is it like to be a missionary wife? Well, in the second part, we'll have Aunt Becky with us, and, yeah. and you can ask some questions to her. So she will be your second truth meter That's right. to <laughs> confirm that whatever you say. It's always nice to have yeah. two people confirm that th the philosophy, what we say, how we work. That's yeah. exactly the way it Wonderful. is. Wonderful. Thank you. You're welcome. Tusen Tag. Thank <laughs> you.